Um, I'm Yona Verwer. I'm the director of the Jewish Art Salon. We are the world's largest Jewish visual arts organization, a global network of contemporary artists and scholars. We have organized 60 art events, exhibitions, workshops, and interactive events in the United States, Israel, and Europe. Um, we explore contemporary Jewish themes related to current issues and reflecting broader societal needs. This Sunday series is organized by the Jewish Art Salon and we have two organizations co-sponsoring. Art Kibbutz is represented today by its brand new board member, Fred Polanyi. Hello everybody, Shalom Aleichem. Thank you, Yona. We're very excited to be part of this. Um, technology brings, is bringing a very small world even smaller and we, I look forward as new member of Art Kibbutz that we're able to continue this series and soon enough um, safely together be able to create and share in person. Thank you for having us part of this. Thank you, Fred. Um, we will now hear from Jada Art, represented by co-founder Jonatas Chaiman. Hello, everybody. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Jonah, for introducing me. Jara is a, an arts organization that promotes uh, metamodernism. We cultivate the metamodern. Uh, we do so mostly via partnerships and art fairs and art exhibits and virtual reality art shows, all kinds of ways to bring everybody together. It's a pleasure to be working with the Jewish Art Salon and be a co-sponsor. Great. So New York City-based Susan Maytel received recent artist fellowships to the McDowell Colony in Yaddo. Her work is in the Smithsonian Museum, and some of her works were acquired by Columbia University. She had a celebrated 25-year career in photography in more than 20 countries for preeminent publications such as the New York Times, Life Magazine, and Time. Thank you, Susan. Please take it away. Hi. This is only my second presentation, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to be able to do it right. I'm going to go to share screen now. Um, which is here. Okay, so I'm, the first work I'm going to be showing is a, an early series called Structured Moments. I don't speak at all during this. It's really an opportunity to just for viewers to look at it and to experience the photographs. So I'm just going to, I'll be doing each slide for about three seconds. With, I had two exhibitions in 1982 with this work, which at that point I was calling uh, people alone, not lonely, but alone. And I brought um, prints um, 
exhibition prints to the New York Times and started getting work for them. So this is some of this work. And now everybody can unmute themselves if they want, or we can unmute them if you want to say something. You know, be my guest. Um, I had photographed him, you know, more on, on one occasion. This is during a, a vi when he visited um, Cairo. And it was really interesting because usually when some, the head of a state would come and visit a country, he would let the, other, the host head of state know that he was coming. Saddam didn't, didn't do that. Everybody knew that the vice president was coming. Then the plane landed. He got off the plane and they have to go run around and find President Mubarak. St. Patrick's Day Parade. Jacques Cousteau. Oh. And there's Ed Koch, the mayor on the upper left. I had done this for Ajons France Press and they never ever ran a photograph of Ed Koch ever. The only time I was assigned to photograph him was they thought he might lose an election. And then I was sent and my instructions were if he lost, then send the photo, otherwise don't bother. Caged aid tots. And Jeff Bridges, he was, he was really, really nice. I was there with a reporter. There was a press person in his suite in the hotel. And I sort of got him to come outside on the balcony of the hotel. And he was just lovely. And he was really happy to get away from everybody also. And he's also a great photographer. Why is this skipping? Um, Anthony Bourdain, chef. He also was absolutely lovely. I had sort of, I didn't want to just do somebody in a kitchen with Chef White. And so I, I staked out and looked for a, a place in the, the meat market where I could, you might be good for a photo. And he was fantastic. John Leguizamo. Um, it was, this is in a the women's bathroom in a, that dive restaurant in the, in the East Village. And that was the reporter had set up to meet look, um, John there. And so um, there was, there was the only place I could figure out which would make a photograph. And he was also really, really lovely. And John Cardinal O'Connor, Lawrence Fishburne, just lovely. And this was after Princess Di the People's Princess died. This is outside the gym where um, she used to go. This was during the NBA finals. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal. This is in Los Angeles. And it was versus the New Jersey Nets. And this is Kobe Bryant sticking it to Jason Kidd. Uh, teaspoon, Teresa Weatherspoon. It was when the New York Liberty um, became Eastern Conference champions. And Ma Matthew Ma Modine can be, is a little bit off to the right with, with sort of dark blonde, little dark blonde hair. It was so exciting. She was so, she so, um, um, has such energy. Uh, this was Kuwait. It was when the Bridgeton hit a mine. And they weren't greeting us. They were asking for proof of identity and things like that. This was, I did a big series on the, with a drug enforcement agency. And this was uh, in an island off of Luxor and um, the poppy fields. A lot of really, a lot of these have really good stories, but that's too time consuming. This was in the during when I was sort of for Life magazine, the women fighters of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. This was after a big battle, and people, you know, were happy to see each other that they did sign. This was during the well, right the Iran Iraq War, 
I was with the Iraqis and Iran had agreed to a United Nations resolution at this, after the, the last, the Battle of Zubaydit. This is also part of the drug story. This was at Ismailia, um, a huge, huge drug raid. Um, do anybody have any questions or want to say anything at this point? If any, okay, no one's, I don't hear anybody talking, so. This is uh, another personal series, Real Unreal Urban Landscapes of the 1980s. I would just go around and uh, I was just walking around and seeing whatever I could see. Most things are done in, on the downtown. Something wrong with it skipping like that. The first, the structured movement is really uh, with people, with people alone. Um, the real and real is representations of people. And then this is another personal project and um, basically dead people. This is at the Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale. Um, it was the 60th anniversary of the liberation. Um, and um, Tom Freudenheim, which some of you know, was involved in that. And Magdalena Abakanovich had an exhibition at that time. And Berlin artists, um, Renata Stee and Frieda Schnack and um, and this is at the, Muse the Griffin Museum of Photography. Frank Tadley, who is with us today, he's the one who um, organized all this and you know, did all the installation. my timer. <laughs> and this was a more recent project at um, rural West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania. This is basically the, that's all those, all the ones, you know, not for the assignment work. Um, but they're film, black and white. It's, it's one lens, 35 millimeter lens, one camera, a Leica um, range finder. The only photograph that had a flash was the one with Jeff Bridges. Nothing else had a flash. Um, and, but more recently I've started, th this was taken in Feb just February, 
um, using a digital camera and actually color and where everything before had never ever been cropped. Um, I have now started cropping. So these, this is very recent. This was outside the Museum of Jewish Heritage downtown Manhattan and just people were there. Oh, this is not, okay, this is not, okay. I, that's, I just added that one today. So that's basically the end of it. So let me go back to this. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Susan. You still have quite a bit of time uh, for people to make comments, ask questions. So I want to open it up to all the viewers. You'll have to unmute yourself. The mute button is on the lower left of your screen. If it's red, that means you're muted. Click on it and you can speak. Uh, Susan, first yeah. of all, I would like to say that it's uh, phenomenal what, that, what I just uh, saw here. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your incredible work. Um, I have a quick question. I, I'm mostly a painter. I definitely am not a photographer. Uh, and so I'm always uh, impressed uh, by works that I'm not so familiar with. My question is, your compositions, you seem to uh, value, uh, you know, uh, centering the main subject and uh, having this kind of unity, especially via your black and whites and uh, your texture and everything. There's so much interest that I believe you can easily, uh, via your ways of doing things, uplift the ordinary almost to the level of the sublime. Uh, it's just incredibly simple what you do, but it's so profound. Uh, are you conscious of these decisions or is it something that comes naturally to you by now? Well, I've, you know, I've thought about that and my favorite poet is William Carlos Williams. My favorite poem is the Red Wheelbarrow poem. So much depends upon the red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon. So I, I take a photograph when I get that so much depends upon moment. I'm walking down the street and suddenly I see something and that's when I take the photograph. It's, it's very intuitive. Oh, what an eye, what an eye. Well, oh, thank you so much, thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi, Loretta. Nice to meet you after all these years. A wonderful presentation. And I did have two quick comments. I found that your Seen and Unseen series yeah. seemed very relevant for today. The whole um, structure and uh, content, uh, I just felt as though, oh, I, I could go outside and see and feel that with what we're going through today. And the other thing is, it was fascinating when you did the project, when you were traveling, and I was wondering if you could just describe that briefly for everyone, how you got into your car and went out and took these photographs. For the, well, I had just, um, that's to make sure I don't have, I, that's, I'm not taking too long. So I set up every five minutes, that thing's <laughs> gonna go off. <laughs> um, well, basically I really wanted to go to rural Ohio, Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And I was really fortunate in a way because Christine Palamadesi, an artist who's also with us today, she um, had an exhibition opening in Pens in uh, in Pennsylvania, so we met there, and then I wanted to go because, to me, that's really America was that that was like a kind of America that I had I didn't have any personal experience with, and I wanted to see what that was like, and um, I slept in my car in campgrounds, which is. Um, so it's, it's really much easier than staying in a hotel because you don't have to like take your hand, you know, your, your luggage and all that and move it all over the place. You just stay there and then you're there. 
So you have, it's like living in, in your home. You sort of like, you're in your home. So I would sleep on the back seat and I would just, I didn't have an itinerary. I would meet people and say, what do you think it's important for an outsider to see? And then and people would make suggestions. That's how I did that. Oh, that's great. So, uh, Su Susan, it's, it's Richard McBee here. I'm okay. really, really impressed with your work, uh, but you don't need me to tell you that. I'm certain that you had lots of recognition and publication, but it is so incredibly strong, especially in terms of composition, of course. Um, what I'm impressed by, because I do a considerable amount of photography also, also even though I'm mainly a painter, um, <clears throat> but my photography is studio photography in which I'm pretty much in control of it with a model, whereas the courage that you have of going out into the world, engaging the world the way you do at times when the world may not be so interested in being engaged and really capturing it, uh, it's simply awesome. And I just want to compliment you on that. It's just really very impressive. One quick question. Um, since you are obviously kind of a bit of the old school, i.e. you're working with a Leica, you're working in black and white, and now you're perhaps exploring the digital, um, do you feel, uh, have you crossed the boundary? Are you now comfortable with the digital? Is it added to your, um, your, your equipment and your vision or is it still, you know, iffy? I'm just curious. Well, no, that's a really, really good question. And I wish I could say I had the answer to that. You know, I, th I think, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm using a little Sony RX100 which fits in a pocket really, really easily. Uh -huh. and, it, and it has, when you press the shutter, it takes the photo, whereas it used to be that the response time was too slow. So this is, you get what you, what you, when you, is that moment that so much depends upon moment, you press the shutter, you, you get it. So right. I think, um, and it's just really, really easy and when I was in the scene unseen, I had 75, oh, six weeks, I, about 4,000 miles. I kept crisscrossing, going back and forth, following people's suggestions. Um, and then I had 75 rolls. You don't know what you're getting. It's a big right, right. issue when you return. And <laughs> then um, I had a lab, you know, not only develop the film, but also make four by six inch, very low, little uh, scan every single full frame, every single image, so that I could then look at it as with, with four by six inch uh, photos. Right, so wow, that wow. Is, yeah, but beyond contact sheets. Well, it's better than a contact sheet in a way. Sure, bigger, bigger, yeah. right, right. With, with, um, with Requiem, um, what I did with that was I had contact sheets made, but instead of a 35 millimeter film is usually, it's 36 frames fits on a, an eight, an eight by 10 or eight and a half length, eight, eight, eight and a half inch piece of paper. And I did it instead, I did 16 by 20 inch. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. So I could see, we have five minutes. So we could see, I could see what it looked like. In fact, Christine Paula Medesi, who is the person whose exhibition I went to in Pennsylvania, she came, oh, Christine, and she's not, that's her name evidently is not a Jewish name, that she was looking at my contact sheet, the 16 by 20, and she started crying. And it was that, so I would mark them up, and I'd put a grease pencil and put them away. I'd mark them up, put them away. And she looked at them, and that's when I decided that I had to do something with them. Right. Because of that reaction. Right, right, right. right. It's, it's also, I hope people appreciate the difference between film photography, which you just described. You'll spend weeks out on the road, right? You don't know what you have. You think what you have because it's in your brain, right? You've seen it, but you don't know exactly how it was necessarily captured as opposed to a digital uh, camera where there, you, there it is. And that's exactly what you have. So it's, it's really a whole other universe. Um, but anyway, congratulations. Really just wonderful work. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so, so much. I, I wanted to say one thing. Can I? 
can I say one thing to Susan? Who is it? It's Honey Lazar. Hi. Hi, Susan. Um, I, I wanted to address the comment that came before um, this last comment, which is to say that something that makes your work, which I, is not simple, it's it, that makes it different from others who walk around with a camera, is the fact that you are you have humility and you understand that the work is a, is the privilege of photographing the person that's in front of you, and every single image sears through the viewer because it's about the subject and that makes you special. That's all I have to say. Oh, well, thank you. Can, can well, I add something to that? I, I, think... I have a following question to that. Oh. Because I think I'm on the line on the, on the list here. This is Maria Finkel. There were a lot of um, comments about Saddam that he had many facsimiles and you never knew if it was the real Saddam that you were talking to. So the question is, did you? Mm -hmm. did, you oh, I, did I what? Did you question it? No, he was surrounded by um, a lot of people with like valises, which pretty much everybody knew had machine guns in them. Uh -huh. And so that it was um, really, you know, he was really protected. And I had photographed him before. And the thing is, like, the, the photo, you can see, like, I think the way he's clenching his jaw is because if he opens it, the venom is going to come out. And I had seen that with him previously. And so that's, and I hadn't, and he would just be walking, and he and Mubarak would be walking, and then I would make sure to be in front, and to get a photograph, and he, he had other people. It was a wonderful 1.8, uh, 85 millimeter, 1.8 uh, lens, of, a Nikon lens, which was wonderful. And that, that's an, actually a cropped image, but it was so so sharp. No, that that's um, yeah, that was him. <laughs> In fact, they he arrived one day. They made they. I had a present, there are two types of press passes. One is a presidential, which means you can go to the palace and all that. And they canceled everybody's press passes. And so I had to go back to the press office and get another press pass before I was allowed to um, attend the next day. Yeah, thank you. Your work is wonderful. Well, thank Enjoy you. It. Susan? Um, Thank you so much. It's really been a, an amazing presentation. And I, I just wanted to say that uh, your series Requiem, really I found so incredibly, uh, it resonated for me. Um, and I found it very interesting how you used landscape. Uh, and you were able so successfully to, uh, to create a sense of human presence in that landscape. And I, I think that much, much of that had to do, as Yonatas spoke about at the beginning of this, um, with you know, the, the architecture and your positioning of the camera, but it really was brilliant. And, and I just want to applaud you and thank you for, for sharing your work with me. Thank you, thank you so much for that. I just. When Andre Cortez, my personal favorite photographer, looked at my work, you know, I, 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 well, from 1983 to 1985 when he passed, one of the things he said to me was, you have the feeling, you have a composition. And so I think, for me, a successful photograph has to have both. And it's not something that, like I, I talk about this so much depends upon moment. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna go, it's, it's not, so, it, it just sort of happens. So, but so thank you. Well, thank you. Susan? Yes? I would just like to say thank you. It was wonderful. I've worked with you many times, known you for many years, and it's just always a huge pleasure to see your work and keep, keep taking pictures. Thank you, that's Anna Clope from Paris. So yes. Hello, so everybody. Together in Israel <laughs> <laughs> and photographing. And I, I photographed her. We were at El Aqsa uh, Mosque and she photographed me. 
we um we had a lot of adventures together. Yeah. So <clears throat> well done, Susan. Susan, this is Nancy. Can you hear me? At what? Yeah, this is Nancy Current. Um, I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed your photographs in terms of my other favorite photographer, who's my brother, um, because he taught me how you show your fellow humanity to other people. Everyone can identify with the people in your photographs, regardless of the fact that they come from a different culture, that we all have a common humanity and you do that so beautifully with, as you say, your feeling and the composition. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Susan, uh, this is John Ashave. Can you hear me, in Washington? I'm on my I'm, I'm on Anna's uh, uh, computer, so it shows her name. Um, I just uh, I guess I wanted to reiterate what everybody has said, but I keep looking at your work and I see how flexible you are depending on the circumstances that you don't really prejudge the moment, which is, uh, in my estimation, extremely important. Not prejudge the moment, just kind of like a dance, you know? You go with the flow and you're able to, in a nanosecond, stop that flow uh, to bring us some really marvelous photographs. and. I really thank you for continuing to be in this business, which is not a very easy business to be in. And uh, I keep thinking of uh, two things. One, this gentleman talked about, uh, you know, the, uh, the digital world. And I keep seeing people uh, taking pictures and looking immediately as to what they got. And... <laughs> By then, they've, they've missed the next nanosecond. Um, so <laughs> be very careful. I know you won't do that, but be very careful because it's innate, you know? Did I get it? Did I not get it? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you know, I've, I've looked at many, many pictures in my life. And um, the other is I truly would love for you, uh, without hurting yourself, to, to bring us what's happening now, which not everybody can, um, can photograph because uh, the absence of light or the absence of movement, uh, the absence of people um, freaks some people out, you know? And uh, I've seen people using now drones, which is fine, you know, I've used drones for some documentaries we worked on, but it, it's, it really takes a special photographer that can wait, you know, and wait and wait because you know something is going to happen. You can feel it and you're going to basically be there for it to happen or not to happen. And very few photographers have that kind of <laughs> patience. And I think you have it and I urge you to do that. But be very careful because... Yeah. Obviously, I want to introduce John Ishave was the international photo editor of U.S. News and World Report when I was based in Cairo. I was based for four years, and he and then he went on to National Geographic, etc. But he was an amazing person to have quote as a boss, um, and he said to me, um, "You have to meet Anna Clope. You have to meet Anna Clope. You have to meet Anna Clope." So I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, you'll like her." And he told Anna, you have to meet Susan Maytel. You have to meet Susan Maytel. You have to meet Susan Maytel. So we were in Jerusalem, and then Anna and I met. So it's like wonderful to have you all here. And I just want to say I have not left my apartment since March 16th. So it's not going to happen. It's not uh, coming out until yeah. I'm, I'm ready to go out. Yeah, we, we've been in for 11 weeks. So anyway, but, you know, maybe you can take some things through your window. Okay, with that suggestion, we have to stop Susan's presentation. Susan, you were clearly way too modest because with your body of work, we should have done a whole hour on you. I didn't realize, you know, just how extensive your work is. So maybe you'll do another session in the fall because um, right now we're all booked uh, for the first part.
thank you, Susan. This was really amazing. We are now moving to our second presenter, Ms. Massachusetts-based Deborah Olim is a printmaker who has shown in exhibitions across the US, Canada, France, Poland, Serbia, South Africa, and Cuba. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Boston Public Library, YIVO Institute New York, the Cordova Museum, and Harvard Art Museum. Um, I am going to mute everybody again, and then when her presentation is over, we'll have seven minutes or so for questions, answers, and comments. So, Deborah, please take it away. Hi, I'm Deborah All. Cannot hear her. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Deborah, I'm sorry. I, I, I muted everybody. I forgot to unmute you. Can you please start <laughs> over? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that, makes me, that makes me feel better. <laughs> okay. Um, I, so my name is Deborah Olin. I'm a visual artist, uh, primarily a printmaker, living and working in Somerville, Massachusetts. And I want to thank the uh, Jewish Arts Line and Yona um, for creating this platform for artists to share their ideas. I think it's great. I've seen some of the other presentations there. It's really a, a wonderful thing to be able to do. And, and thanks to everybody who's spending their Sunday with us. So um, I, I wanted to talk about um, my upcoming exhibition uh, at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Um, the the uh, exhibition is called Every Protection. And um, it was scheduled to open on April 30th, which of course didn't happen, um, but it's gonna happen. And <laughs> I'll let you know when it does happen. So um, it's uh, uh, inspired, the Every Protection series was inspired by um, S. Ansky and his uh, Yiddish uh, ethnographic program, which was a questionnaire of 2,087 questions uh, that ranged from before the beginning of life to after death. And uh, the questions are amazing and the question, it's extensive <laughs> to say the least. Um, so these were uh, the Jews that were living in the Russian Pale of Settlement uh, between 1912 and 1914. And at the time, 40% of the Jewish population uh, was living uh, in the, the Pale Settlement. So um, in uh, 2008, I read an article in Pachentrager, it's the, um, the National Yiddish Book Center um, magazine. And uh, Nathaniel Deutsch uh, was uh, translating the questions from Yiddish into English for the first time. And the article was about that. Um, it was called A Total Account. And um, I just was very excited by this article. And uh, I wrote to Professor Deutsch, he teaches at the University of California in Santa Cruz, and I wrote to him and I, um, I told him I was a visual artist. Uh, I told him that I was very excited about his article and this project. And I was wondering if there was any way he would share the questions that dealt with pregnancy and childbirth. And uh, Professor Deutsch wrote back to me and he said, uh, I went to your website, I love your artwork, and perhaps we can do a collaboration. So, uh, that's what happened. And so in 2011, I had an exhibition at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And the um, exhibition was uh, in conjunction with the uh, publishing of his book here. So uh, this is, yeah. Um, the Jewish Dark Continent, Life and Death in the Russian Pale of Settlement which doesn't really sound very exciting, but it really is. It's a really interesting. And um, so um, I'm gonna show you some images. Uh, it's on a PowerPoint, so I have to go away to do that part of it, um, but I'm still here uh, speaking to you. And um, I'm just gonna say, so there were 20 pieces in, uh, in the show. Uh, nine of them are gonna be at the museum at Eldridge Street. Um, and there's also going to be an installation in the women's balcony of the synagogue, uh, which I'm really excited about doing. 
So um, I, I'm going to move over there now. And I'm, ju I'm just going to say that um, I hope that you'll come to see the exhibition because even though I'm going to show you all the work, um, you, there's a lot of detail and a lot of texture in these pieces that does not translate well on the screen. So let's see how we do here. I'm going to go here. Okay, is this working? <laughs> yep, it works. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna start out by reading you um, an introduction by uh, Nathaniel Deutsch to give you a little bit of the flavor of this, um, this study. In the Jewish communities of the Pale of Settlement, the life journey of the person, the mensch, did not begin with conception, nor did it end with death. Rather, the individual soul or neshoma pre-existed the body and in some cases had already gone through many incarnations or gilulim before being placed in a particular fetus. Similarly, when an individual died, both soul and body continued to exist in some form. Within this great journey, the period of pregnancy marked a critical stage in which the fate of the unborn person could be influenced for good or bad and childbirth signified the crossing of an important and dangerous frontier for both mother and child. So this is the first piece I'm showing. Uh, this is called Every Protection, 37 by 52 inches. And you can see in the skirt of this figure, um, there's the image of an ultrasound. And I kind of feel like the ultrasound is a way that we feel protected today. Um, a pregnant woman gets to see what it looks like in there and that there's a, a healthy fetus growing. Um, and then superimposed on top of the uh, ultrasound is the acupuncture chart for the ear. And the ear is the same shape as the fetus and it's used to connect pressure points to the organs of the body. And the question that's on this piece is, um, is there a belief that one must not place a child in front of a mirror until it gets his first teeth? So um, I'm gonna move to the next one. Um, but uh, you can tell by that question, it's a very <laughs> pointed question. Um, Anski grew up in the Pale Settlement and he knew the shtetls and he knew the, uh, what was going on there. He actually grew up in Vitebsk, which is the same town that Mark Chagall is from. So you know from Mark Chagall's imagery, it was a place that was um, just really, really uh, strong with uh, Hasidic and Kabbalistic imagery um, and magical thinking. So, um, so that's kind of a lot of where this is coming from. This piece is called, oh, hang on. <laughs> Totem of Questions, 45 by 53. This print contains five questions moving through the, through the fetus shapes on the left. What does a person's soul do before it enters the body? Is it considered a charm for a pregnant woman to wear an apron? How does the soul enter the body? What beliefs exist concerning a child who was born with teeth? Is there a belief that one must not rock an empty cradle? This is Out of Harm's Way 2, it's uh, 39 by 57. And the questions on this print are, what songs, dances, and games do people teach a child? Which ones to a boy and which ones to a girl? And is it considered of benefit for a woman having difficulty giving birth to tie one end of a string to a Torah scroll and the other end of the string to the leg of the bed of the woman in labor? So um, the vessel at the top has an illustration from a book called The Little New Angel. And this is a book that my grandfather read to me often as a child. It was a story of an angel, Michael, who was about to be born. And while he was in heaven, the shot. So I just wanted to say that um, you know, all cultures have superstitions and beliefs about pregnancy and childbirth, and that I'm interested in making connections between seemingly disparate cultures and finding avenues to unity. So um, 
The figure on the left is, uh, is modeled after the figure in the acupuncture chart. Okay, we'll see how we do here. <laughs> this is um, considered a charm. And, uh, okay. Um, so you probably noticed that uh, there's a use of garments or garment patterning in my prints. Uh, I use garments as a, as a metaphor for the body. A coat represents protection and a slip of vulnerability. Uh, my grandfather was a tailor and I spent a lot of time with him in the shop. So uh, this print includes the question about tying the string to the leg of uh, the Torah scroll and um, that I, I talked about previously. Uh, you know, there's 283 questions just about pregnancy and childbirth. And somehow I managed to um, use the same questions um, over many times. And uh, let me see. Okay. Um, okay, this is called... No. Got it. Okay. Can everybody? Is that good? Yeah. All right. Go. It did. Oh, didn't. There we go. Okay. Good. Uh, do signs exist? This print uh, also repeats previously read questions. I want to mention these little figures on the top left vessel. There are little characters that come off of a popular medieval amulet to protect the mother and child against the attack by Lilith during childbirth. Uh, again, you can see the coat pattern in the illustration from Little New Angel. Okay, could you let me know if there's a problem with any of these images? No, we can see them just fine, thank you. Okay, good. Cradle of safety, in this print, um, you can um, see hanging off the ultrasound is the full medieval amulet that I talked about in the last image. Okay, this, um, this is called the Dress of Unending Questions, 20 by 24 by 70. So I come from a background in sculpture and I like the challenge of moving from 3D to 3, from 2D to 3D in my prints. And, um, and so this has the, the question about, um, are there signs that indicate whether a woman is pregnant with a male or female child? And um, there's questions in English that are weaving through the skirt. So uh, the dress is bordered with feet and Nathaniel Deutsch wrote a beautiful essay in the catalog that accompanied the exhibition in Santa Cruz. And this is what he said about the feet. In Kabbalistic and Hasidic sources, feet are associated with the feminine aspect of God known as the Shekhinah and the expression feet of the Shekhinah refers to wandering in exile, something experienced by the people of Israel. The wandering Sadiqim or holy men of early Hasidism, the Shekhinah herself as she accompanies the Jews in their exile, and indeed by all human beings once we leave the womb. Oh good, it's working. <laughs> uh, signs of protection. And um, this work uh, also has the acupuncture figure and the uh, illustration from the little new angel. And um, also in the, uh, in the middle where the, uh, the violin image is, there's an appropriate illustration of a pregnant woman. Okay, and um, this is called Consuming the Questions. 38 by 64. There's a, you'll notice that there's a lot of storks in, uh, in these prints and um, there's a widespread folk tradition that the stork brings babies into the world and this might be because the stork has a reputation for kindness towards its young. So um, the piece on the left here is sorry, the importance of language. And um, the question on the print is, what words do people first teach a child to say? And some of my interest in this project comes with my longstanding love of the Yiddish language. So, so, social anthropologist Wayne Davis says that out of the 7,000 languages now spoken around the world, half of them are not being taught to children. And losing a language is in part losing a culture. There's words in Yiddish that cannot be translated into English. And an example of this is the word machatunum. So I think maybe a lot of you know that word. Um, 
and it, it has to do with the relationship between the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom. And there isn't a comparable word in, that exists in English. And the relationship can be explained, but there's not a word to describe this connection. And so why isn't there a word for this? And my thinking is that it's because it's not an important bond in this culture. So it doesn't get a name. And the print on the right is called T-shirt Totem 24 by 69. This might be one of the only prints that doesn't have any questions in it. Um, on the bottom T-shirt, you can see our little, our little guys, our little um, medieval amulet characters. The uh, T-shirt above that says Nisht Ains, and, um, and that has to do with uh, the superstition about uh, it being bad luck to count your children. Um, it's considered bragging and it can bring around the angel of death. Um, and the middle uh, t-shirt has, um, it, this is also from the Little New Angel book and uh, it has a, a poem in it. Neath thy cradle hush a by, a snow white kid has come to lie, almonds and raisins will he buy. So here we go, pendulum. Oh. Going the wrong way. One more. No, this is on my top. It's not going. All right. Here it is. Okay, got it. Got it? Yep. Yeah. Pendulum. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Okay, this this print includes the question at what moment do you think do people think the soul enters the body of the fetus? And I just find this so incredibly interesting and timely. I mean, it's what we're all we're all dealing with and uh, debating about right now. And uh, these images, let me see what happens here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Islet with Angel. The next four images all use this Islet dress. Uh, this is my grandmother's dress. And, um, and one of the things that I love about uh, printmaking, the etching ink is really stiff and it picks up texture beautifully. All the darts and seams and threads um, from the garment shows through. So I'm just gonna go through these quickly because I think my time went. Uh, Islet Vessel Birds, and okay, this is called The Importance of Play too. And this print includes images of hands playing Cat's Cradle, which is the string game. Um, and this game is something that has been documented to be, it has been played all over the world and um, from cultures that have no connection um, and some of which are completely isolated. And uh, this last one, Ily with apron, is it considered a charm for a pregnant woman to wear an apron? And uh, on the left, the importance of play, and on the right, out of harm's way, uh, 24 by 64, uh, there's little mirrors hanging off those amulets to bounce back the evil eye. And, the last one here, floating questions, and a couple of questions that are on this. Um, is there a belief that a pregnant woman should not lend anything from her house? What protective amulets, incantations, and charms are there to protect a woman from the evil eye? So out of this, nine of these prints will be shown at the Eldridge, and this is um, a, a mock-up of the installation that I'm going to have in the uh, Eldridge Synagogue in the, uh, the women's balcony hanging above. So you can see the, the slip, the, the coat for protection, the feet of Shekhinah, and the uh, conversation of the questions kind of uh, threading through the garments and connecting them. Um, meant to be the conversation between the women, the conversation you kind of have in your head when you're trying to figure things out. Um, and this one uh, is just a detail, not coming up very good. Come up? Okay, good. Okay, so that is the uh, presentation. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave this up for a minute in case um, anybody wants to uh, take a picture of this or write it down. Um, the contact about the exhibition. There's also a um, interview and studio visit that uh, Nancy Johnson, the curator at the, um, the museum at Eldred Street uh, did 
uh, where we had no te technical difficulties. So if you want to go see that, um, and I'm going to come back, hopefully. To okay, uh, Deborah, before we go forth, um, there were two requests for you to hold up the book that inspired you so people could take sure. a screenshot. <laughs> Can you see that? Is that yes, yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank Got you. It? Okay, yep. good. All right. Well, I'm very sorry about the technical part. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm really focused on my artwork more on the, uh, on the uh, 21st century technology. But thank you, Yuma, for <laughs> putting up with me. <laughs> no problem, Baba. I, I explained to the audience while we were waiting that you live, you know, in rural Massachusetts. So who knows what the Wi-Fi does out there. It's so not I'm rural. I'm right next to Boston. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Deborah, I, I want to be the first one to make a comment. Um, you were absolutely right. You said like, you know, it may not sound all that interesting, this subject, but it really is. And I too thought like, hmm, childbirth, you know, never having given birth. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure how interesting this is for me. I was fascinated, all the stuff about amulets, which is something I work with in my own work and all the uh -huh. spiritual aspects, the Shekhinah. I'm like, whoa, I need to know more about this project. So thank you so much. It was really great. Oh, thank you. That's nice. That's Everybody great. else who wants to make a comment, um, unmute yourself and, um, and we, we can go a little longer. You know, we're, it's fine that we're running late. Don't worry about it. I don't know. Can you do something to the recording to like <laughs> edit it? So. <laughs> well, I don't like social... <laughs> I'm still looking for a video editor to, to help edit these. So uh, as soon as we find one, if we find one, we can do that. Otherwise, it'll have to stay in. <laughs> And I would, I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Um, these, it, it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much um, for sharing all of your work with us. I'm, wa I'm wondering this, um, this book that you just held up and the questions, were these questions curated by Ansky or were these questions that Ansky himself asked? Where were these questions coming from? All right, Einstein put together this questionnaire. He he wrote these questions, and I think I don't know. People probably know so, Einstein more as a um, a playwright. Well, he also was, as as a Bundist, also. So I'm wondering, okay, right? Cool. So I'm wondering in that context, where were like these are very specific halachic questions. So I'm wondering if he was asking these questions or curated them um, more as uh, you know satire whether he was asking them in jest or whether this was a serious halachic undertaking of the time. And, I and think whether it was you know the serious. answer. I, I think it was serious. I think um, Anski actually, he went through many different uh, transformations in his life. And, uh, you know, like I said, he grew up in the pale and he, uh, you know, it was the age of enlightenment. He wanted to get out. He did spend some time in the, in the Bund and he spent some time doing a lot of other things. Um, but he, uh, as he got older, I think he was kind of lamenting the fact that um, the Jewish culture was going to be lost. I don't think I mentioned the name of the installation. It's called From the Oral Torah. And he connected uh, the Jewish culture. He called it the Oral Torah or the People's Torah. And he felt that it was really important to document the, the, um, the daily life and the, um, just the, the stories, the songs, the jokes, um, all the kind of um, uh, healing uh, kinds of things that, um, that were going on, that he could see that the world was changing and these things were gonna be lost forever. And he didn't sure. want to be stuck in that time, he wanted, he really wanted artists to use his, this information to move forward. Um, he called it Oithleven, to go forward and, and create new things with these ideas. So um, I'm trying to make him proud. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering the question. Sure. I have a question. Oh, all right. Hi. Am I on? Yes. Hi, yeah. Hi, okay. Joel Solverstein, nice to meet you, Deborah. Um, I want to just tell you, uh, your work is really incredible and really interesting. 
I'm really intrigued with it, Mr. I would say also like consider building a golem because your work is totally like in line with that. <laughs> Um, but seriously, like uh, in my own work, I use the notion of history. I do a lot of biblical narrative to try to get past the text into thinking about what it would be like to be that person in that situation. What's the role? Like, do you have to will yourself into a certain um, historical context or a certain visual mode? Because your work is very specific and it has this kind of folkloric, shtetl like quality. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I have to go too far. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I mean, my grandparents were refugees. I, I feel like, um, I don't know, I just kind of, I, I feel a connection to that time. And, um, and yeah, so, 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 and I'm really interested in folklore and superstition and not just in Jewish culture, but across cultures. So um, it, it's a pretty easy transition for me. Yeah. That's great. Kind of following up on that, uh, Deborah, thank you very much, Richard McPhee. Uh, following up on that, one question that came to me was, as you're dealing with this stuff and you're getting inside of it, um, it's a peculiar question, but the question has to be asked, as, as it was asked about Ansky, is that do you believe it? In other words, um, he, he is basically an anthropologist, he's a sociologist, he's asking the questions because that is no longer his world. He doesn't believe that world, but he cherishes it because it's part of his, his parents and his past. Um, so same, my question then is to you, is, is this, are, are, the, are these works of belief? Are they works of anthropology? Or, and, and really, that's really not a question, a, a personal question, I'm really in a way asking, how do you approach it? I think I approach it as a question. <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, there is that he, he's dealing with the cycle and there is that part of the cycle after you die and before you're born, we have no idea. There's no way to know. And we can believe whatever we want to believe, but we don't know and we never will know. So um, I feel like it's kind of, the way of the Jews to ask questions. I think that uh, the one thing that we didn't talk about here is that there are no answers, that uh, this study was never completed. And the, there, there are no answers to these 2,087 questions. So I find that really remarkable too. And, um, and that's compelling and that kind of uh, really me into this. You're really taking a dialogue as it were. Exactly, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I can oh, interrupt. Yeah. Um, Ezra Rose said that, that he's for some reason, hello, he's not muted, he couldn't speak. He said there are questions that um, people have been asking about what kind of materials you use, the media, woodcuts, etching is like one important one that more than one, per and what are the garments made from? It looks like paper, difficult to tell. So what are the last two dresses made of? So a lot of people want to know about your materials. Thank you, Susan. Um, so um, they're all, uh, the 2D work is all monoprint, uh, collaged with other uh, things added like mirrors and buttons and string and so forth. The 3D ones and the garments uh, behind me here uh, that are going to the installation are also paper. It's an Okawara, it's a, a Japanese paper, beautiful paper, and, um, and I wax the paper. And then I crumple it up, so it's it's really strong and kind of a little indestructible. Um, so that's that's basically what I what I'm what I'm working with is is paper and wax and um, gauze, uh, a few buttons here and there, <laughs> some mirrors. Yeah, it's pretty simple. <laughs> uh, Deborah, I, uh, going off of the answer you gave to Richard McBee, uh, it was a great answer. Uh, to say that uh, you're more interested in the questions than in uh -huh. the answers. That was, that's great. I, I praise you for that because I believe that's what us artists uh, must do. Um, and then um, commenting and asking you to expound a little bit further on what uh, Hannah Wiesenthal uh, asked, uh, in dealing with uh, Jewish law, halaha, right? And we have uh, so many questions sometimes. I, I come from a background where you know, in a way, we 
we try to stay away from superstition, uh, a, a very rumbumist kind of a way of dealing with Judaism, very uh, Western uh, Sephardic way. Uh, but um, at the same time, when I create, I try to not push away any questions. And I'm not reflecting myself in my own practice. Are you ever approached? Because you, you spoke about this. You look at superstition from different angles, different cultures. It doesn't necessarily deal with you. Are you ever approached by people who misunderstand that this is not your self, it is your art? More like questions. How do you deal with that? Um, I've never really run into that. Um, mostly what uh, kind of response I get um, is from women from all different cultures that come to me and say, oh, I don't believe this. You know, my mother told me never to go to the zoo when I was pregnant because oh. if I saw an ugly animal, it would reflect on how, what kind of a baby I had. Oh, or, you know, that there's just... Yeah. Um, something that's called imprinting, which is um, Greek women, Chinese women, um, you know, women from uh, Latino women, but they come up to me and, they're, and they find a kind of a bond with this, with the past and with these, these ideas. And maybe, you know, as a modern woman, you don't believe them, but there is a, you want to, you, I mean, why not be as safe as you can? You know, whatever. <laughs> what, does it does it hurt like to that. put an amulet in your pocket? I mean, is it gonna, like, what, what, what's the problem? So sure, sure. <laughs> Good day. Better be safe than sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Every avenue. <laughs> Very well, thank, you. thank you so of course. much. Thank you. Well, also, Yonatas, in a way, you know, our questions are who we are. So, mm. of course, you listen. I mean. Am I different my, from my art? Well, you know, only marginally, really. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at the end of the day, once I have a painting and I kind of let it go and, it's, and I'm no longer working on it, uh, yeah, it has a life of its own. But there's a piece of me there. Those are my babies. And they're like, you know, it's, it's you know, I don't, I don't really feel in too much of a divorce. Uh, and maybe, by the way, I don't necessarily like what I see in my art. That's me. But <laughs> hey. <laughs> That, you know? Great comment, Richard. You're absolutely right. Definitely. I agree, I, I, Richard. I mean, it ultimately comes down to a question of integrity. And I think without using that word without being judgmental, integrity meaning are you in connection or what is your relationship to the actual subject matter which you're choosing to, to deal with? And I think that that really was the question in it, or at least that's how I heard your question, Richard, mm -hmm. at the beginning was, mm -hmm. you know, where do you um, find your authority to work with the subject matter that you work with and how do you approach it? Right? Mm -hmm. Am I correct in, <laughs> in yeah, paraphrasing I just, you? <laughs> I just want to jump in here for a second. Uh, two items. One is that we are now, technically speaking, at the end of Deborah's session. So I want to open up questions and comments for both artists. Um, and the second thing is some of the people had, had trouble getting through when they wanted to ask questions. So here is my request for those of you who are out there asking questions. The minute you see someone pop on the screen, the big screen, the speaker screen, that means they are people who started to speak and ask a question. So then refrain from asking your question. And my request to the person who starts to ask the question, keep talking so that you will, that people then realize, oh, this person is not asking a question so they can stop talking. I hope that helps. Um, so now I wanna open it up to everybody for either one of the artists. Oh, and for those of you, I'm sorry. For those of you who need to sign off soon, I quickly wanna announce next week's presenters who amazingly both touch on things that Deborah has been touching on. So Alan Falk, um, his work touches on um, Ansky's drama, The Dibbuck. Uh, Alan made a series called Song of Songs that's inspired by that same author that Deborah was oh. also inspired by. And the other presenter, Becca Starr, uh, he will show artwork based on the Shekhina, which she describes as the sacred primordial divine feminine. So kind of interesting that they both go into those directions. Anyway, everybody else, 
ask your questions. The minute you see someone else pop on the screen, stop talking. Come that, that person is then asking a question. That seemed like a little bit too much. Uh, I like your work. Uh, I think it is, this is Brewer Finkel. Um, I think it's um, both intelligent, sensitive. The fact that you're using Yiddish is right, very interesting. Uh, that a connection to uh, a subliminal connection now to the pale and to the uh, uh, ideas uh, that were really working at the time. Uh, I have a piece that my great, and my husband's great, great, great father had done. It's a cutout that in the middle of the cutout, I don't have it on, on, on hand, he has a sentence where he talks about pregnancy and motherhood and protecting the witches should be away from the woman who is pregnant. And that was part of the family uh, archives that we have. It's also a part of our um, history. Um, one of the pieces that he has done is now at the, at the New York Museum, the Jewish Museum in New York, and one is at this Kerbal Museum here. So the ideas of protecting the, the family, protecting <coughs> the woman at the time of a very important part where her body is producing another being uh, has been in generations, in all cultures, as you described, a very familiar question, a very familiar intent to support and protect the next generation. And um, in that case, I'd say your work is really speaking its word. You're using imagery like the uh, bird, which comes actually from a very different culture, more uh, Northern, you know, the whole idea of the bird bringing the child or bringing the, the bird to, but the image is so perfect. And, and so it works well, and it works uh, with great um, sense. And so, thank you so much. I've been enjoying your work. Thank you, thank you. Is there any way I could get an image of that piece with a witch thing in the middle? Is that something that could happen? Do you have an image of it, a photo of it, or anything? I will send it to you. And, oh, I would love and, and, that. And I just wrote down your work. Uh, is it DebraOllen.com? That's my yes. That's my my website, and and my email is on my website. I can find your email from there. Yes, it's on there. I would love that. Thank I would love perfect. to see that. I'll also send you a catalog of of uh, an exhibition that I did in twenty. Uh, 07, uh, there was uh, Breaking in Two that uh, the Getty has supported at the time. And uh, you will see this was a combination of many, many different women from different cultures and mostly Los Angeles people. I think we had one from San Francisco. But it is the experience of having a child. The experience of having giving birth is something that women really understand very deeply. It changes both your life, it changes your body, it changes your con conception of the world. It really does. I, Thank you I just so wanted much. to say, being familiar with Bruria's work intimately, yes. um, <laughs> there is a real connection here between Buria's work and Deborah's work uh, that I was realizing, um, you know, as I was watching Deborah's presentations. I hope the two of you really do connect someday. And, and yeah, I'd like to see. I'd like to see yeah. this catalog. I'm excited. Yeah. Thank you. I'm working on a new uh, a new website, so it may be a, a few months. 
Uh, but you can go to my own website. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other comments, questions for either Deborah or Susan? I guess we have reached the end of the session then, if nobody has a question. Um, thank you both so much, Susan and Deborah. This was fascinating. I'm so glad you shared your work with us uh, because Susan, for instance, is right here in New York City, but I have never seen her work. So it's not even about people from far away connecting with people you know, from far away. It's even in your own community. You may not know what's going on exactly. And Deborah, you of course, I would never have you know seen anything because although if you you know once you do show it the Eldridge Street Museum, of course I'll come and visit. Um, but I'm happy to meet you. <laughs> Likewise. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, the viewers, for participating. Your great questions and everything. And um, hope to see you all next Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you.